Uh, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn once again to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5. We're in Nehemiah chapter 5, and we'll be reading uh, all 19 verses of chapter 5. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have have our fields and our vineyards. I was angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we as far as we are able have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and said to them, Swear to do as they have promised. I also uh, shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as the Lord, as they had promised. Moreover, from that time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because I, because of the fear of the Lord. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were, were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds. And every ten days, all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. And he prays, Remember my good, O my God, all that I have done for this people, and may God bless the reading of his word. It's at the end of this chapter we see, uh, we see the generosity really coming out of, of Nehemiah. And he recounts all that he's done, all that he has been doing. And I don't think by any means he was being braggadocious or puffing himself up, but he was pleading with the officials to, so that they would <clears throat> recognize what he's doing, and they too should be the, doing the very same thing. Uh, they should be acting differently toward those in need. So Paul encouraged his, his readers to follow uh, his example. Nehemiah was encouraging the nobles and he was encouraging the officials to follow his example and be the same way. Because there were some who were taking advantage of the situation, as you read in, or heard in the story and the account. Uh, some despised the poor. Uh, some preyed upon the poor to use them for their own, own advantage, not for the good of the, those individuals, but to suit their own purposes. And so some were perfectly happy to see the work that was supposed to be going on stop because that's another thing you you see in this passage of scripture there's really 
little evidence of the continuation of the building of the wall because of these individuals. And so they were willing to see God's work stop to get their own, no matter what the cost was to others. And so there's a lot going on in this passage of Scripture. And that I want to state the obvious thing that this is a narrative passage of Scripture. And there's many nuances, many things that you can pick up from this passage of Scripture. I mean, there is an overarching thing, as there always in, is in a passage of Scripture. And so we have to ask the question, what does this passage of Scripture teach? What can I learn from this passage? And, and ultimately, ultimately, God reveals His glory in every passage of Scripture. Every verse we read uh, should drive us into a closer relationship and closer walk with the Lord. It reveals His character and His attributes. But in this passage of Scripture, one of the things I want to focus on today is, is how, should, how should we interact with one another as Christians? How should we act toward one another as, a, as our brothers and our sisters in Christ? It was uh, Warren Wiersbe who said this, often when a church enters into a building program or a church begins to grow, all sorts of problems start to surface that people didn't even know were there. And it's what we see the evidence of here in this passage of scripture. Uh, you see, when problems arise, we need to recognize that the problems were already there. It only becomes obvious the moment that difficulties arise, the moment that certain situations have happened. And so we really need to ask ourselves as we, as we think about this idea today is what's going on and why did this happen? And oftentimes our problems are systemic problems and much older than the current situation as we see in this passage of scripture. So it was quite obvious that, that Nehemiah, and the people of the city of Jerusalem were at a crisis moment in their existence. The rebuilding of the wall was moving along admirably, and then all of a sudden, it stopped. It, it went on dis, despite the impending uh, attack, possibility of atta attack by the enemy. But here, everything had stopped for a short period of time. The rebuilding was at a standstill. The reasons are varied. I mean, there are many reasons why but I would argue as we read in this passage of Scripture that what was going on was just a revelation of what was already there. So let's explore this passage of Scripture a little bit. Let's see what's happening, and let's see if we can answer the question. And this is another thought I want you to consider today, along the same lines of what we should learn. This question is this, what, what would be missing from the biblical account if this story was not in the Bible? What would be missing and let me state the obvious answer there, nothing really, because God would ultimately reveal what he wanted us to know. But there are some lessons from this narrative that we, we need to understand and make some application in our lives. And so as we read, the very first thing we see is this fact that the people cried out. Verse, verse 1, they were crying out. Why did they cry out to Nehemiah? Why did they cry out to him? They, because they were being taken advantage of by the nobles in Jerusalem. It's interesting to know that they were not crying out against the Samaritans, the Ammonites, the Arabs, Sambalat, Tobiah, or Geshem. They were crying out about their own people. This was Jews exploiting Jews. And so it's a tragic thing. It's a terrible thing when it ever happens, but even more so when we see it happen in, the, in, the, in God's family. So these people could not help themselves, and that's why they were crying out to Nehemiah. That's why they were looking to him for help, so he could maybe help fix the problem. So there were four different groups of people we see in this passage of Scripture. Really more than four, but four who had some situations and things that were going on. Verse 2 reveals the first group. These were the people who owned no land, but they needed food. You see, this population, as people were coming back into Jerusalem, the population was increasing. There was famine in the land, and the people were just hungry. And so these people could not help themselves, so they cried out to Nehemiah for help. Verse 3 reveals the next group, the second group. This was primarily composed of landowners that had mortgaged their land, their property, just so that they could buy food. Apparently, inflation was on the rise. The prices were going higher, and the combination of debt and inflation was enough to wipe out what these people had. Sounds like the year 2024, doesn't it? 
Verse 4 reveals the third group of people. These individuals cl- complained because their taxes were, were too high and they were forced to borrow money to pay them. So in order to borrow money, they had to give security. They had to mortgage their properties. And eventually that meant that they, they lost their property. In that day and age, the, the king would uh, collect a tax and it would be for his own coffers or for his own bank account. It wouldn't be to provide services for people. One, one of the things that we have, at least in, in our day and age, when we uh, pay taxes, there is to some extent that goes to benefit us as well as, as others. But in that day, uh, you just paid your taxes and you, know, you saw not, nothing about it. You, you might not have even uh, le- uh, been left with your life because the king had that much authority. And so uh, the, the taxes that they were exacting didn't support the local services. They supported the king. And there's a fourth group of people in this land, in this uh, account. This was the group of the wealthy Jews, and they were exploiting their own brothers and their own sisters, and they were, they were loaning them money and taking the lands and their children as collateral. And so the Jews had to choose between food, uh, starvation, or servitude. I mean, and ultimately, they, they obviously chose to become slaves. This is really quite a, quite a problem for the nation of Israel. This is quite a difficult problem for the Jews. God very, was very explicit to the Jews on these topics. In fact, in Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 through 20, it says that a Jew could loan money to other Jews, but they were, they were expressly forbidden from charging any sort of interest. That was like the money lenders. In contrast to that verse of Scripture, it says they were allowed to charge the foreigners, but they should give to their brothers or charge or give it without any charge or interest. That's what they were supposed to do. They could charge interest to a foreigner, but for their, for their brothers and sisters, they just loaned it to them. They, gave, they loaned it to them with no expectation of getting anything back from it. No, no interest, no influence or anything at all. So they just loaned to their brother and sister. Yes, they should have expected them to repay, but they weren't allowed to charge them interest. They were to give without any expectation of return. And so there were some who were giving with strings attached. There were, there were strings attached to what they did. And, and we've seen this in our day and age. There are those who feel like you do something good for me, you owe me something. Uh, you know, I, I personally don't like to owe anybody, but there are some who do simply for the purpose so that you would owe them. This is the same idea. So if you feel like you owe somebody for their goodness and their benevolence, you need to first recognize that uh, their deeds should have been as unto the Lord, and therefore you owe the Lord, not those individuals. So the man who loans his land, who makes a loan and uses it for personal gain is who they're describing. The Jews were to treat one another with love, even in the matter of taking security. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 through 13, read this way. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep on his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord. You see, they were, they were forbidden from making their brother a servant. And there is this sense in which God is trying to teach the children of Israel and ultimately us how we interact and how we treat our brothers. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 35 through 46, read this way. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. 
For they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over them ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. As your male and female slaves whom you have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you. You have been born in the land and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons and uh, after you to inherit it as possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers of Israel you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. See, ultimately, both the people and both the land belong to God. Ultimately, as we think about, about this idea, this concept here, that all of it belongs to God. It's His. And He just merely loans to us for this season of time we are here on this earth. So the land, all the things that we have, they belong to the Lord. And He wouldn't have anyone taking advantage of another of a disadvantaged person, or using an individual for their personal gain. All of our possessions are a gift from the Lord. The breath we breathe, the strength we have, the homes we live in, the vehicles we drive, the shoes we wear, the clothes on our back, they're all a gift from the Lord. Yes, I realize that there, there are, there are you know, some people live differently, have a different sort of lifestyle. But as we as Christians need to understand that what we have ultimately belongs to the Lord, we are merely borrowing it for this season of time we live on this earth. And so when we come back to church and, and make, understand this, when we put our offering in the plate, what we're saying, and we're bringing something to the church and we, we surrender it to the church, what we're saying is this belongs to the Lord. And we're giving back to the Lord what we have already been blessed with. So when you give to the church, it belongs to God and to His church. But Leviticus 25, it talks about the year of Jubilee. There was something else that was going on. One of the reasons that God had ordained this idea for the Jews was to bring balance to Israel so that the rich could not get richer or the poor could become poorer. And what was the year of Jubilee? Every 50th year, every 50th year, if, if a individual owned a, owed a landowner a debt, it was wiped away. It was forgiven. So it was on this 50th year, a designated time, that uh, all the debts were forgiven, all the slaves were set free. I mean, an individual, if they wanted to remain, uh, what would happen is they would take their ear, they would stamp it, and they'd put a, uh, something significant there to show that they were a servant and a slave. And there were some who actually... Uh, were, were willing to be treated this way because their masters, those that were over them, were really generous people. But the year of Jubilee was this idea of the fact that all debts were forgiven. And sometimes we, we need to recognize that the year of Jubilee is all the time for the Christian. For the Christian, it is all the time. In fact, the New Testament describes Jesus as our Jubilee. And so we constantly live with an attitude of forgiveness. And we don't harbor a debt. We don't restrain people back. We don't hold things over their head. We forgive. And we, we forget. Because what would happen in this year of Jubilee, uh, you know, certainly they remembered it. I'm not saying that, but they could never go backwards. They could never go back and lord it or flaunt it over them. So this year of Jubilee is a very significant idea. And for you and I, we live that way every single day as we uh, covenant together, we come spend our time together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we forgive one another. And, and I can hear you now, uh, Pastor, you're stepping on my toes. It's hard to forgive, isn't it? Because we have long, long memories. You know, uh, as Dave was giving his prayer a few minutes ago, I chuckled to myself when he, when he described the 70 times 7 as 490 times which we're supposed to forgive. I thought to myself as, as I was remembering the wedding yesterday, I can imagine not that necessarily that couple, but every couple knows this, that you know, 490 uh, times of forgiveness doesn't make it through probably the first week. <laughs> uh, and the idea is we, we regularly forgive. We, we truly forgive. You say, I, but somebody owes me. Well, forgive. 
Jesus is your jubilee. I want to make somebody pay. Well, don't, because Jesus is the jubilee. And ultimately, vengeance is his. And you and I, we have this responsibility to forgive. And that's the idea of this year of jubilee. And that's this idea here of debt and forgiveness, that we we don't owe one another because we are all God's possessions. We all belong to him, and therefore we owe him everything, and we are just on this journey together. So here we see these wealthy landowners, these nobles, and these officials who were exploiting the poor in order to make themselves rich. They used their influence and they thought that they were okay. I mean, they were okay with the building process, but they wanted their cut. After all, they were the nobles and the officials. And these individuals were using their power to rob some and put others into bondage. And it was greed that drove these individuals. Greed of money. And greed was one of the sins that really uh, plagued the nation of Israel before they went to Babylon. It was they were greedy. And so some covet money, some covet power, some covet influence. And so we need to be very careful. But God has a very special concern for the poor and those that are disenfranchised and those that are uh, that we owe or somebody who owes us. God has a special concern for those and he will not hold those individuals guiltless who take advantage of their brethren. The second thing we see in this passage of scriptures is this fact that Nehemiah was angry because of this situation. Verse six tells us that he was angry. Uh, His people, the Jews, had forgotten the very simple truths that God had blessed them with, that God had brought them from uh, slavery and that they were all equal and that God had blessed them and they they simply had forgotten this. His people, the Jews, were were spiritually uh, backslidden and they readily robbed one another to their own end. And what Nehemiah saw as a superficial outside physical problem really revealed itself not as an economic problem but as a, a spiritual problem as a spiritual condition. You see, it's a spiritual problem when when those who hold power or those who hold control or those who are owed a debt or or they're owed money or influence and they do, they take these things at the expense of others, especially our brothers and sisters. It's a spiritual problem when someone holds power over the poor to influence them or to taint them. And Nehemiah, What he was doing in this passage of scripture, he was asking not what is popular, because the popular thing is to let let them do what they want to do. He was asking the question, what is the right thing to do? It was his holy anger against the sin of the people that really drove him to the place where he started asking the question, what does the law of God say? What does the Bible teach about this? And oftentimes that's the last thing we do is go to the Bible. We go to many other sources. But we need to make sure that our source for what we're doing as Christians is first permeated, first found in the Bible. So it's important to notice that the growth and the building of the wall did not create the problems. It revealed the problem. It revealed what was already there. It was already there. And as the walls started being put up and these individuals, it created this culture and this environment where these nobles felt like they had to do this or could do this. Verse number seven is kind of interesting. And as as you look at it, you see Nehemiah said either, depending on your translation, it says consulted with his own heart or he took counsel for himself. And so what you see is Nehemiah, he's kind of sitting back. He's looking and he's evaluating the situation. He's trying to figure out how to address the situation. And really the only way he could do this, the only way he could do this is if he was thoughtful about what God's word had taught. So he considered the Old Testament law. A few of those verses we read a moment ago. And so before he called these nobles and these officials in, he he prayed about it. He he thought about it, he contemplated, and as he thought within himself, he took counsel within himself, he was careful about making sure that what he did lined up with what the Word of God taught. And so as he brought them in, he rebuked these uh, nobles, he rebuked the officials, he reminded them of God's goodness to their nation. 
He said, you have been set free. He argued that you are going to now put others into bondage. And we need to remind ourselves of that as Christians. We've been set free. We need to treat our brothers and our sisters in the same way with grace. You see, we are in a community of faith. I don't know if you've noticed it, but sometimes it's more difficult to be uh, gracious toward your brother and sisters in Christ than anyone. It's oftentimes easier to be unforgiving toward our brothers, and so we need to be very careful. Yes, we should be just as forgiving to the world around us, but we, we need to exemplify it here in the body of Christ. We should be kind and giving without any expectation of return to those in the household of faith. So Nehemiah, he appealed to the Old Testament law, God's word, as he commanded them to restore the ill-gotten gain. And it's, it's important as, he, as you read this story, it's obvious that the enemy was probably standing on the outside looking in and laughing at the battles that were going on, at what was going on. And that's always the case. Satan looks at us, and as we battle over insignificant tidbits, we think our treasures or tribute or the things we have are the most valuable and the most important, when the most important thing at this moment is for us to get through and begin to forgive one another and begin moving forward. So Nehemiah's rebuke, it rested on God's word. Yes, the situation needed correcting, but he went to the Bible to correct. He went to the Old Testament law to correct. So Nehemiah, he appealed to their freedom. That's, that was what God had given them. God himself, he was their deliverer. In the past, God redeemed Israel and he was appealing for them. He was appealing in such a way that he said, remember the captivity. Remember where you came from in Egypt. And even now, it should still be fresh in their minds. They were, many of them were coming out of captivity in Babylon, coming back to Jerusalem, coming back to rebuild the city. And so it should have been fresh in their mind. And so, so he was reminding them. See, Nehemiah and the other leading Jews had helped redeem some of the people and bring them back. And now their Jews, other fellow Jews, were putting them back into bondage. So Nehemiah, he demanded, he demanded that those who exacted usury or to repay those individuals for what they had charged. It sort of reminds me of the story of Zacchaeus in the New Testament. You remember Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. he climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see. And you remember when, when he saw the Lord, and, he, and he's not talking about just physically looking at Jesus, but he looked at Jesus in such a way that Jesus captured his heart. It was at that moment in which Zacchaeus saw Jesus and he realized that he was the Son of God. He, he was the Savior. He was the Messiah. He was everything that he, he was looking for, all he was hoping for. And when he had this encounter with Christ, it changed him. And so when, and of course, as you know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He, you know, in their day, they had the right to exact a, just about anything they wanted to. Large amounts above the, the necessary tax. And so he had probably extorted from a lot of people. And so he, he ended up, as he said, because of his changed heart, he gave back. He gave back and then some. He surrendered uh, the things that were so dear to him. And you and I, we see this idea here in which uh, Nehemiah, he's, a, he's appealing to their, their sense of biblical responsibility, which supersedes everything. It supersedes everything. And he was appealing to their sense of biblical responsibility. Not precedent because precedent said they could do exactly what they were doing. I mean, the law said he, they had the law on their side. They had the right to exact this, this interest. And I don't mean God's law. I mean man's law. I mean, they could do anything they wanted to do because they were the nobles and the officials and everyone else were just people. And so we... We need to make sure that we're not flaunting the wrong things and we're, we're appealing to the Bible, not, not the governing authorities of our government in the world today. We appeal to God's word. And Nehemiah appealed to God's word. He was angry because of the situation because they, they chose not to appeal or apply God's word. So the third thing we see in this passage of scripture about Nehemiah is that he, he led by example. Dwight L. Moody said this, a holy life will produce the deepest impression. 
Lighthouses blow no horns, they only shine. What he's saying is that our, our actions speak louder than words. In the Marine Corps, we used to have this expression, we'd talk about our superiors as they sent us out in the field to pick up cigarette butts and trash and all sorts of other things. And, and this is what we would, we would say. They're, they're saying, do what I say, not what I do, because they'd sit back and sip coffee while we were out doing the hard work. And, and so this is the idea here. Um, we, as, we don't need to toot our own horn. We just need to plug away and do, do the right thing. And so Nehemiah, he led by example. And so, but, but we see here that Nehemiah wasn't tooting his own horn. There's a difference in what he's doing and what he did than what I'm talking about. Nehemiah talked about what he did and he was saying, follow my example. So that was one of the other models, lead by example. And he was leading by example. Nehemiah, he believed that he was a servant leader. And it was during his first 12 years uh, as governor and then again during his second term of office there that he used his privileges not for himself, but to help other people. He didn't use the people to build a kingdom for himself, but he used his privilege to be able to help other people, to do for other people, to serve other people, to make sure other people were lifted up. You know, typically most officials, they, they exercise authority in such a way to promote themselves and to protect their personal interests and have very little concern for the needs of other people. I just read uh, something in the news, uh, I think it was uh, just a heading that I saw this morning, and it was uh, one particular official in Washington um, made some investment in January, it was made $1.25 million. I thought, well, they're not concerned about us. You know, that's, that's the typical. I mean, that's the usual. But what we see from Nehemiah here is that he was giving of himself. He was surrendering his money. He was doing what he had to do to help lift up other people. That's why, he, that's why he's so different. That's what we see from, from Scripture here. You see, the, the nobles had little regard for the building of the wall. All they wanted what was theirs. The wall was the evidence of God's work and the evidence of God's blessing. And these nobles, they were more concerned for their own little kingdoms, what they were going to receive and get out of it, than for the work of God. So in what ways was Nehemiah an example to his men? What, how was he an example to us? Uh, as we see here, he had assistance. And they didn't use the official expense accounts for their household expenses. They, they, nor did they use the taxes of the people to, to line their own pockets. They didn't ask for anything. They just did what they were supposed to do. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul followed a similar policy with, with the church at Corinth. He could have accepted a salary and support from them, but instead he chose not to. He said he would do it without cost. But Paul did not say that every Christian worker should do this. In fact, 1 Timothy 5.18 says something to the contrary. It says, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. The laborer deserves his wages. So there, there's two sides to this idea. There's two sides. And what we see from Nehemiah is that he is willing to give as the mission goes forward. So Nehemiah, he participated in the work. And you contrast him with a very different group of people, the nobles and the officials who were exacting usury, directed at the work, uh, directed the work rather than they rather than helped. So Nehemiah, he gave of his own resources for the good of the people. But he cried out to God as, as the very last thing he says in verse 19. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. He said, Lord, remember me. He's saying, Lord, you know, I know that my reward is not here. My reward is with you. My reward is in heaven. My reward is will come from you. And I don't know who said this. I don't, it might have been Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said the leader often gets the blame and little of the credit. And so Nehemiah was saying here the importance, the importance of this fact that he recognized that ultimately God was going to bless him. So Nehemiah's appeal before God won't go unanswered because ultimately it is God who rewards. So the question is, what do we learn from this story today? Well, there's some interesting lessons in this passage of Scripture. 
the first one, and maybe you have one, maybe you see one, and if, if you have gleaned a different lesson than this or another lesson to, than this, let me know on the way out. But the first one is this. Christians should never develop a sense of entitlement. I mean, the nobles and the officials, they were entitled. What is an entitlement? I went to Webster's. It means something that you feel you have the right to do or have what you want without having to work for it or deserve it just because of who you are. So entitlement and greed it drove the hearts of these men. They felt like they deserved whatever they were getting. You see, entitlement is, is drove them to the place where they were collecting usury. They somehow believed that they deserved something that in reality uh, they were taking advantage of and using their fellow Jews. It's not that God didn't want to bless them, didn't want them to flourish financially, but he didn't want them to operate and act in a greedy manner. In essence, it didn't please God. The second thing is we, we must avoid developing cold hearts. I mean, when we come against the various things in this world, it's easy for us to develop cold hearts. A selfish cold heart only wants what it wants without any regard to whoever has to pay the bill or who it hurts or who it uses or who it takes advantage of. And that's what these nobles were doing. And so Nehemiah was confronting them. We need to remember that we owe all to Christ. And we do in, a, in the same way. We act unjustly toward our brothers in Christ rather than operating grace. Christians need to develop this generous, giving heart. This means with our money and our possessions, all these things belong to the Lord. When we give to the Lord, we give to Him. It is His. We should hold our possessions loosely as we recognize that it is the Lord's and He has blessed us with it. He has blessed us with all we have. I mean, that's a, that's a hard lesson. I mean, because you think about it, you work hard. You put up with a lot. And you come home, but, but ultimately it's God who gives you the strength. It's God who gives the ability. And so everything you have ultimately belongs to the Lord. Give it to Him. And finally, we must restore those things that we've taken from our brothers. I mean, what, if, what have you taken from your brother? Well, you may not have taken their possessions, but maybe you've taken something from them. Something that only you can give back. I pray that, you know, if you think about that, Think about what you might possibly have taken from a brother. It might be time to restore it. This morning as we close during a time of commitment and decision, you know, the, the lesson today, the message today, really should encourage us to consider our brothers and our sisters in Christ. I hope and pray that as you think about this, as you think about how you interact with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Is there anybody, anybody that you're exacting interest from? Is there anybody that you're holding a debt over their head? Is there anybody that you need to forgive? I mean, it's a simple question. I would imagine as we consider the last eight or nine months in church life, there's probably a person or two that you need to forgive. And if you haven't, what a wonderful day it would be. What a wonderful day it would be to look at your brother or your sister and say, today's the year of Jubilee. Your debt is forgiven to me. But they, they owe me. Your debt is forgiven today. But they haven't asked for it. Their debt is forgiven today. I pray that you will forgive. As we close during this time of decision, I do hope and pray that you will think about that person. Think about those people and find a way to forgive them. Heavenly Father, we pray that during this time of committal, Lord, that we would seriously entertain this idea of forgiving our brothers and our sisters not harboring a debt over their head, not exacting and squeezing the life out of our anger, Lord, but truly surrendering these things to you, Lord, because we recognize the great grace by which we have been saved, the freedom we have in Christ, the glory we have, knowing that we're in your family and that we're on this journey, Lord, one another with one another 
following you, sinners equally walking, arms locked in arm on our journey. Help us, Father, to remember these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.